For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verse 7. <clears throat> this is our 14th lesson on that verse. <laughs> Shirley? <laughs> I already said you And so... Uh, put that up there. <clears throat> and... Um, We've been talking about the, Paul listed six uh, characteristics of a spiritual maturity of super grace um, status uh, that is uh, good to apply to chapters 8 and 9. And we have, uh, if I'm right on my calculations, and I'm not always right about it, but I think this is our 14th lesson tonight, and then I've got one tomorrow night to wrap it all up with. And <laughs> it better be because I'm going to give you a test. After 14 weeks, I'm going to give you a test. How many questions? Is a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it because. I thought I was going to cover all this in six lessons. I really did. So I, I don't know. I, I've learned I'm not in control of anything in, in church or at home or anywhere anymore. I'm just kind of a floater now in my life. But anyhow, let's open with a word of prayer. It's a moment for you to look within your own priesthood according to uh, 1 Peter 2. Under the new covenant, every believer is a priest after the order of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. And that's a high status privilege for us. And one of those is that you have the responsibility to confess personal sin, which hinders the ministry of the Holy Spirit, at least in Bible study, as in other areas of your life. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. And that cleansing allows the Holy Spirit to be restored to his rightful place as teacher of the word of God in Bible study. He will teach you the truth and the truth will set you free. So I'm going to give you a moment that I, I just quoted 1 John 1, 9, but mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and a verse sin should be considered and confessed if necessary. If the Holy Spirit has brought conviction. The sin will bring conviction, but if the Holy Spirit has doubled up on that, then certainly that should be confessed. Well, Father, we're so thankful for each person that's come our way to study with us tonight on the subject of spiritual growth. Uh, people often ask me, where do you get the idea of super grace? And my pastor taught it, um, and I've advanced the idea that in my own mind in ministry, <clears throat> um, it is a great concept. I do believe Paul believed it. I believe Paul taught it. I think he might have called it a, by a different name, but certainly it's a doctrinal principle. So we <clears throat> pray the Holy Spirit would minister this lesson as we talk about the aspect of grace. Grace that works in every stage of our growth, but how it works specifically in the capacity now of our Christian life. How does it work in our capacity of spiritual growth maturity? Um, and so I pray you would uh, <coughs> encourage your hearts with the study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, uh, last Wednesday, <coughs> excuse me, we studied uh, stages one, and we, we've talked about four stages of spiritual growth. In the Christian life, <clears throat> and last week, and we've taken all six of these. Uh, we've studied uh, pistis, faith, logos, 
word or utterance. Uh, we have studied um, gnosis knowledge. We have studied spude diligence. We have studied agape love. And tonight, and the last, we're on our third lesson on uh, charis or grace. And we're looking at the subject matter in spiritual growth. So last last Wednesday when we met, because we didn't meet, I think Tuesday we didn't meet, did we, because of the uh, yeah. weather. <clears throat> but tonight we're looking at, uh, and so we, we last Wednesday we studied st grace in stage one and two. And tonight we're looking at uh, how God's grace works in stage three and four of spiritual growth maturity. Now you recall that uh, Paul put a, a, at least in my opinion, put a Greek word onto stage three. He called it technon. He's done that. Of course, he's teaching out of the Greek language, but, you know, we had brethos for stage one and napios for stage two, and now we have technon for stage three and teleos for stage four. These were words, and the English sometimes has really difficulty trying to nail it down. I mean, you take teleos, for example, uh, or even necton, where we are, nec, nec, uh, nec, necnon, well, my goodness, technon, I don't know where, I, my, my tongue wasn't going nowhere, my mind was, <clears throat> it's kind of like my feet, sometimes my feet don't go where my mind is, <clears throat> but um, anyhow, technon, uh, sometimes this word is, what, we've seen this word translated many ways, sometimes the English will translate it babe, sometime infant and for english that means something different to me if you say that this is a baby i think somebody's got you know 24 hour care of that if you say infant i think maybe we got something that may be in the toddler stage or something <clears throat> technon don't doesn't technon is greater than that it it, it may include that uh, from the do what? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to think what they're doing with it because they're all over the place with this word. You see, but what it really is is a an immature adult. Now, culturally, cu culturally, that's different ages, isn't it? Some cultures, you know, that you could. I mean, some call it like the Jewish twelve and thirteen. You entered this. Uh, in America, I don't even know where it is anymore, probably 25, 28, something like that. <laughs> I don't know where it is. Uh, when I was a kid, if you graduated from high school, you were out. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they gave you they gave you a certificate in one hand, your mother took the keys back in the other one. And, and so it was kind of an interesting place to be in your life. Uh, but Technon is a word, it's a spiritual Im immature adult, a, but immature in a good sense. I'm not talking about immature where they ought to be mature and they're immature because that's childish. But this is a technon that reaches, is immature. I mean, he's got to go through immaturity to get to maturity, and <clears throat> we call it adolescence, and that's just stretches everywhere. But, but anyhow, that, and so y this word is used that, and if you, and of course, if you don't, if you go here, you'll know it because I'll point these things out when we study the Greek language, our, our biblical text from the Greek language. But in Galatians 4.19 is a good example of where this could be applied. By the time you get to stage three, because stage one and stage two, stage one is basic milk doctrines. Stage two is advanced milk doctrines on salvation. That's where you begin to get into the theology idea of salvation. Uh it's now about the Christian life. It's, it's, it's basic meat, but it's about the Christian life. For example, in Galatians 4.19, Paul talks about him travailing for uh, the people that have been under his ministry until, they, until Christ be formed in you. Until Christ be formed in you. Well, this is the stage. A baby don't think about that. He's just glad to be saved. I mean, he's just glad to be snatched from the jaw of death kind of thing, you know. <clears throat> and uh, usually a stage two, the person is so engaged in the theology of salvation 
that he doesn't. But now that he's got the foundation, by the time you get through stage one and two, you have now the foundation of salvation under your belt. Now you're able to advance into, well, who is this Christ and what does it mean to be in Christ and what does it mean when Christ is me and how, where is the how, Holy Spirit? And how am I spiritual and all that? Then this becomes an issue. This becomes a, a viable issue uh, until Christ be formed in me. And, and so you begin to explore that idea. What does that mean? What does it mean that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation? I mean, I, I believe that, but what does that mean? And this is the stage where uh, emphasis is placed by the Holy Spirit upon your life to learn more about the Christian life and how it's to be lived. And, and this is a very important. So we call it the basic meat uh, out, out of... Um, Hebrews 5.14. In 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul wrote, You therefore, my son, and he used the word technon, you therefore, my son, be strong. And he puts it in the imperative mood because he's capable of doing it. This word, enduamo'o, is a word. Notice that's a preposition on front of that word. Dunamis, you know, most people are familiar with power, Right? Dunamis is where you get the word English dynamite, and it means mostly powerful or very strong. <clears throat> um, and then we add the preposition into. This means that this is an inner power and strength. And Paul, Paul issues a command to the technon. He can issue. He couldn't do this to a, a baby believer. You can't do. You don't issue those. We can hear, and he says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice where, notice where, he, where his learning has to be. Now watch this. Now you're going to miss this. Be strong. Look what he says. He be, be strong in the grace. Where is it? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. See? Now, when he gets to stage four, he's going to talk about it in you. But you've got to learn that where the true international, uh, international in, internal power comes from, stage three, it comes from Je everything's about Jesus Christ. You know, uh, he's a son, I'm a son. He's a priest, I'm a priest. That's where this all t begins to transpire and to find your, uh, who am I now in Christ? Who, who am I now that I'm in Christ? Who am I? And what responsibility do I have towards that? In other words, when I, listen, this didn't, it never rang a bell when I was first saved that <clears throat> I was a son of God. It didn't ring a bell. But boy, when I hid here, I, it dawned on me, oh, wait a minute. I really am a son of God. He really is my daddy. Now, what responsibility do I have to him and what does he have to me? Because I had been under parents. I knew what it meant to be a son under parents. You understand? And so that, that was the first time that I can remember it clicking in my head. Okay, huh. And so that led me to research and begin to study the relationship idea. If he's my father and I'm his son, what responsibility do I have? Well, the first thing that dawned on me, that I'm this is a family. Now, this is a, that was a, I can't begin to tell you what a big deal that was for me because my father was killed in the Second World War and instead of put, sticking me off someplace, my grandparents took me. My grandparents raised me. And I was a fortunate guy because I always had a family and I always had a loving, nurturing family. And they were my parents. My mother, uh, in the Second World War, she dropped me off at Grandma's house, and uh, I stayed there until she picked me back up when I started high school. And my mother went off uh, to the factories and, and was highly motivated to supply her, her husband with all the weapons and all the things necessary to win the war to come home. And she went to the factory. And she was motivated as a patriot as much as my father was to go to war. I didn't see my mother back 
uh, for about 14 years. I mean, she, uh, when I say that, I'm talking about as a mother-son relationship. She came back weekends and things like that. I mean, but she was like a sister. She wasn't there when I needed her and was sick. My grandparents were there. I mean, I, all my memories and all my great moral mores of my life came from my grandparents. I mean, I talk about them all the time, but why shouldn't I? But when it, when it hit me that God was my father and I was his son, it clicked inside of me, whoa, what is this family if I'm involved with? What kind of a father and what responsibility do I have within this relationship not only as father and son, but as family. And that took on a whole new meaning in my life. <clears throat> and then I discovered that this was one of 20 status privileges. Then I began to go through these. Then I, I discovered that I was a priest because Jesus was a high priest. And then I was told, you know, as I began to look at that, that it wasn't order of the, after the order of Levi. So, I didn't have to go to the Old Testament to find anything out because none of that was relevant to me as a priest in the New Testament. Anything of a priesthood of the Old Testament wasn't relevant to me because Jesus' order was after Melchizedek. And who, who knows who Melchizedek is? Now, don't tell me. <laughs> but who knows that? But mine is not after Melchizedek. Mine's after Jesus Christ. He is my high priest. And my priesthood is after his. And that's a new covenant priesthood. That's a pretty amazing thing to me. And then I want, okay, if he's my high priest, what's required of me? What? I mean, he's the head guy. Okay, I'm the priest. Then how does this work? Then, then I become, uh, then I discover there are gifts. Then I understand that he's the head of the church and I'm part of the body and the body's made up of gifts. Then I'm in, and that's the church. And now I'm in a whole nother ball game. You understand? And by the time I got through with those 20 status privileges in studying them, I mean, my life had been dramatically changed by the Word of God. That's stage three. When you begin to get engaged with this stuff and, and, and begin to understand that this is actually who you are, this becomes pretty exciting. I mean... This becomes pretty exciting. It changed my life in ways you can't imagine. I mean, I, I mean, when I discovered I had the gift of pastor teacher, I got to tell you, I mean, I cried. Not for joy. I cried. I had the premier greatest job in the whole world as far as job. And I was told... I was going to give that up and pastor a church. Jeez, I tried that. So, thing. This church sure did. It's the best thing. This church has been the congregation far exceeds my ability. I mean, he gave me the right church. All the churches, he gave me the right one. Keeps me on my toes. Just listen to me talk. One question, one statement. It's life, it's life wonderful. It, it is to me. <laughs> Boy, it is to me. There's the kid from Podunk, I can tell you. Kid from Podunk is pretty good. But anyhow, I want, I want to come back to this idea. Therefore, my son, be strong. And we're talking about inner strength, Ralph. We're talking about inner strength. Be strong in grace. That's in Christ Jesus, and that's, that's a key issue. In 1 Peter 1.14, he uses the word technon again. I don't know what your Bible says, but it's the word technon. And he, he refers to us as become obedient children. And he says, let me warn you, and this is a great warning for stage three. When he calls you a technon, he said, let me tell you, let me put a red, sign, let me put a red flag up here in stage three. He says, do not be conformed to the, your former lust because that will, that will sink your ship. 
Now, I'm not talking you're not going to be saved. I just mean you're not going to keep mo moving forward. It's going, to, it's going to sink your ship. Now, listen to what he just said. He said, in stage three, I'm going to tell you what you've got to come face to face with, and that's your former lust of the flesh. What he means by that is, listen, this is where life, this is, this is where life hits the pavement. You know, the, the rubber hitting the pavement. This is where life hits reality. Stage three. He's going to, and listen, he'll point them out. Listen, <laughs> as soon as in this stage, you're going to learn how important confession of sin is to spirituality. Because God don't want you to live in the flesh. And, every t and listen what's going to happen to you in stage three. Every time you confess a sin, he's going to make, he's going to make a mountain out of molehill with it. <laughs> oh, oh, I can laugh now. Oh, I can laugh now. He gonna, he gonna, he's going to make it so much bigger than it is. <laughs> he gonna, he, he's going he's gonna to like put a chain around you and let you drag it for a little bit. You know what he's trying to tell you? What Paul is trying to tell you in class. Do not be conformed because your former lust is being conformed to the ways of the world. Romans 12. Get into transformation. And listen, he can't get us into transformation, transformation until we get out of confirmation. You understand? Stop being conformed to the world. And so he puts this red flag up and he says at stage three, this is where we stop doing the old stuff. And, and you know where I found most of my old stuff? I don't know where you find it, but my, my closet was my home. Oh, man. And listen, it, it could be your job. It's who, where, whoever can push your buttons. And, that, and wherever that is, somebody has really spent some time finding out what your buttons are. You know, when I say your emotional buttons... And, you know, for some people, it doesn't take them long to be in your presence before they've figured out a couple, and they'll work them on you. They may not that day, but they'll, they'll bring them back and work them on you because they've become expert in buttons. No, oh, why do you just pay attention to it a little bit? A couple of little, a couple of social gatherings, and somebody will have your number. They will have already figured out a couple buttons on you. Well, anyhow, why don't you go to 1 Peter with me? In 1 Peter 1... Uh, I want to look at uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 10, James Peter. Oh. Now watch it. This is, uh, and I wrote a little note up here on 1 Peter 1, 10 through 6. Says, Peter gave three points. I pulled out three points. Uh, I found three points that I want to share that Peter said, important to spiritual growth development at stage three, in my opinion. In verse 10, he says, and this takes us out of phase two, verse 10. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories to come. And you've really, the, at stage two, you've really got to get settled down who this person, Jesus Christ, was that come to earth. Theologically, not just theologically, you really need to nail that thing down. And, and, um, and, and you need to be aware that when you read the passages like 1 Corinthians um, 15, 3 and 4, it says, you know, but, uh, the scriptures declared that he would die on a cross and the scriptures declared that he would be buried and raised from the dead. Or, or you go to uh, second Timothy, all scripture is inspired and profitable. <clears throat> that's, that's very important stuff. And here he's, he's talking about that very aspect. And then in verse 12, he says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. That's, 
And what he's talking about is the prophetic gospel, an important point in the apex of human biblical history, has become historical Christology. Prophetic Christology has become historical Christology. Then he says, therefore, based on verses 10, 11, and 12, therefore, gird your minds for actions. Keep sober, keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That would be the second advent. As obedient children, and that's our technon, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, that we just mentioned that, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all of your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. See, that's a key issue now to stage three. You've got, you've got to get beyond your salvation. You've got to be founded well in that I'm saved, I'm eternally secured by the grace of God and all of that, and to be secured in the work, personal work of Jesus Christ that brought you there. Now it's time to move on with from there. That's the foundation. That's verse 10, 11, and 12. Now we need to get on. Now we need to gird our minds for action, keep sober, Fix your hope completely on grace to be brought to you. In other words, grace all the way from salvation to eternity. And then he says, he gives you the warning, and then he gives you, uh, listen, we've been saved to be holy on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, we've been called to be holy people. And, and the wonderful thing is, and every believer can be because the word holy is where you get the word Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so, I mean, this is the period for that. So at stage three, it's important to understand the prophetic gospel of the Old Testament fulfilled, as I just mentioned. I give you a lot of scriptures for that. And then the second thing is he, in, in, verses thir- in verse 13, he's really talking about the consistency in the inhale and exhale of the word of God as important to stage three. I mean, when you hit stage three, the word of God, the word of God is just, it, it, the, the, and, and listen, when you discover the importance of the word of God, man cannot live. One of the verses I remember way back, the hundred years ago when I got saved, was, was Matthew 4.4. 4. It, it came out of Jesus' temptation. Uh, uh, man cannot live by bread alone, but needs every word. Now, that made so much sense to me as a young believer. Uh, but it didn't take on meaning in my life until I hit a stage three growth where, I mean, I heard that and I understood it. Man cannot live by bread alone, but never. I mean, I understood man cannot live by bread alone. I wasn't sure how, how that meant, except it sounded pretty important to me. Well, when I got to stage three, I wanted to know the other part of that. I grew up knowing, you, you know, you got to eat, stay alive, right? You can, yeah. So, I mean, th- they were connected. But how was my, see, living and eating were connected. How does that translate to the Word of God? See? So that became, uh, that now that became a pretty big issue to me. And I discovered that you have to be a spiritual person, to cycle the Word of God. Then I discovered that you have to cycle it by faith. I discovered the, the main thing in stage three that I discovered about the Word of God was categorical. Now, when I was in my theological training, they talked about subjects and topics. They never talked about category of doctrine. There was a whole course that we took called Christian doctrines, but nobody, and we looked at them as a subject topically, but because they didn't understand how to teach for growth, it was like taking a history class in school. You know what I mean? You don't, it, it, was, secu- it was theologically, but secular in the way it was the way it was instructed to you it wasn't laid out in order to build it wasn't laid out like a lawyer you know where you build your case and win win it i mean you can't just go in and say well i got a degree I, this is a no contest i you know i, I got a 40 and um, 
So what'd you get? Well, I got 3.5. Well, I win. That's not how it works, eh? <clears throat> but I discovered when I, when, I, when I began to study under Bob Thiem, uh, he taught categorically. And when I was going through my the theological training, that's what I wanted. I wanted it. I didn't want it just topical. I wanted it laid out so that it built a case for me of why I should apply it. Does that make sense to you? It, it did to me. I liked the way it was laid out. It was laid out in a very, you know, point one, point two, point three, and it was taking you someplace that was important to your life for application. And boy, the light bulbs went off inside of my head. And I went, wow. Well, after I stayed under that kind of level of teaching, I mean, I just began to develop. I mean, I could remember things that, that, like, the way that it was laid out. It was kind of like, the, and then it made sense to me that if you lay it out the way Jesus did, like man cannot live by bread alone, ding, ding, but every word that proceeds in the mouth of God. We well, caught me on the first one. It took me a while to catch up on the second one. But he caught me on the first one. And, uh, and that was a, and at stage three, if you're under, if you're under uh, somebody that understands that system, then you should begin to be able to see the significance of that type of thing. Now, um, I teach a lot slower than I used to teach because I want application. I want this to be practical in your life. And I'm more interested in the application than I am how much information I give you. I've learned over the years that you can give people a whole lot of information, but if it doesn't translate into their spiritual health, that's not healthy. So I've changed, I've changed my approach a little bit. So I go a lot slower, as you can, surely I go a lot slower than I used to go. All right. And that's the reason. But anyhow, he goes into this and, and, and gird up your minds. You remember where he said, gird up your minds? Gird up your minds. Uh, and then he tells you to, in, in that verse, he tells you to gird up, gird up your minds uh, and then keep sober in spirit. Uh, keep your hope uh, completely uh, and your hope, fix your hope completely on grace until uh, the second coming. Uh, then the third thing that is of importance to me uh, here is spirituality. These three things that Peter mentions here to me are really important in stage three. They were in my life at least. <clears throat> the, the consistency, the consistency of inhale, exhale of the word of God. <clears throat> and the ability to, to access it quicker is important. Now, I've been getting a lot of training in that <laughs> in stage four, but uh, I certainly understood the principle when I was in stage three. Consistent spirituality is breaking the cycle of carnality, and you remember he mentions that in verse 14, didn't he? Um, uh, and uh, why people don't pay attention, I didn't write this down, but just over somewhere on your, uh, write down 1 Corinthians 2.14, through the third chapter, verse 3, because he tells you there's one person who you are before you're saved, and there's two people that you could be after you're saved. There's only one person you can be before you're saved, but there's two people you can be after you get saved. And the two people you can be after you get saved can never be the person who was before you got saved. And he th that's not as easy as... Man can live by bread. <laughs> Look, the one person, the one person that everybody is before they're saved is sukikas. It's in the in the in the Bible, he's called the natural man. The sukikas, it means the soulish man. He's not saved. He doesn't have the spirit of God. And so in um, 1 Corinthians 2:14, he's called the sukikas. That's, I, I don't want to spell it, I don't want to write it. Just sukikas. Uh, he's the soulish man. The English calls him the natural man, at least the NAS does. But in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, now the person who has been born again, he can either be pneumatikos, he can either be spiritual, or he can be carnal. Sarkikos. Okay? He can be, 
He can be, he can be spiritual. The, the saved person can be either spiritual or he can be carnal. He can either walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. You can never be, once you're saved, you can never be the natural man. Because now you've been born again. You're no longer. Now you've been born of the spirit and the spirit is in you. You can be spiritual or you can be carnal because you still have a sinful nature. You still have an inclination towards it. That's why he talks about your former lust. Now, you didn't talk about your former sin. But he did talk about your former lust. All right? Mm -hmm. Just so I thought I'd tell you. All right. And I gave you a lot of scripture for that. The writer of Hebrews points out two things every believer, every believer should learn about his priesthood at stage three. At st stage three, you're going to learn about spiritual gifts. If you're in a good church, you're going to learn about spiritual gifts. You're going to get very curious about it because you're part of the body of Christ and your gift your spirit, you, got, you see, the moment you got saved, you kept 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you became part of, that you were baptized by the spirit into Christ, and into church, right? <coughs> now, who you are in the church, in the body of Christ, is based on your spiritual gift that was given to you at salvation. You can, that's recorded in three places, spiritual gifts are recorded in three places in the New Testament. First, First Corinthians 12 through 14, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4. Those are the main passages. And this is very important. And listen, <clears throat> this means that your gift is important in two categories. It means it's important to the church locally as well as universally. Right? Because we're part of a universal church as well as a local church. <clears throat> you should, your gift is needed within the local church as well as the other church. The church universal. Okay? And... Do not neglect either one of them. One of the reasons, now I'm a, I, I'm, I've always been a local pastor teacher. I've always been a local church guy. Okay? I've never desired to do anything. I, don't, I very seldom go off and hold conferences or go to some other place and teach. If they have a pastor teacher, what, what am I doing there? Right? Man, I have, a, I have a problem with that. Why would I leave my... Why would I leave my family? Why would I leave my, why would I do all that if they already have a pastor, right? I'm not there to hold a revival. I'm not there. Now, sometimes I'm asked to come in and do something special or something with them on a special occasion within their life or their work or whatever. I'm glad to do that. But otherwise, I, I don't, why would I do that? I mean, I just, <clears throat> but the Lord has put in my heart about this thing and so I, I stay home, and we sent people requested, uh, you know, to listen to us. And so, we, you know, the Internet makes it very easy to get onto the access of Internets. And so we did that. And, um, uh, and I, listened to rep I listened to people write back and, you know, if you're interested in our ministry, write back, tell me what you're getting, what you need. Wh what is it you need? What are you getting? What are you getting from here that you're not getting from there? And whatever you're getting from me is to, should motivate you to hit your knees and be sure that you can get it there. That's what the church is all about, isn't it? <clears throat> and so uh, I've chose to, to allow us to go to this uh, wherever we are. I don't know. I look into a camera every once in a while. Where, only God knows where we're going with this. <clears throat> but to try to minister and feed, because I know I was, I was so starved to death for the truth of the word of God. 
I was engaged in a local church, but I was starved to death. I spent more money at the Baptist Bookstore than you can imagine, just wanting basic answers. And I could have never afforded, I, was, I didn't have enough money to do all that. And when I was given an opportunity to study the Word of God on a grace basis, it changed my life. Changed my, absolutely changed my life. And so be, having the opportunity to do that and to put it out there, and if you want it, you got it. And this church will serve your needs to get you to a place in your life where you can be a productive missionary person out there where you've got to live and can't leave. I mean, I know a lot of people. I get, I, they write me letters. They're in places where they can't get out. They can't. They are, they're locked in. And... It's amazing places that, that have internet access. I mean, it's amazing to me. So w we have decided to offer whatever we're getting here to others who would like it just to extend our ministry beyond our walls um, until they can get enough solid information in their souls to plant, plant a flag, flag themselves and meet others that are locked into that community like they are. And they need to find each other. And one of the ways I think they can find each other is through that. Hopefully, that's how we found each other in it. Uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, is a, is a point that is of great importance to our priesthood in stage three. Now, I knew that I was a priest, but I don't know what that meant. I, I did know one time I, I uh I was down at St. Vincent and went through the little thing where you have to pay back then you had to pay your money to two dollars at the little gal sitting there. <laughs> and I wore a I wore a, a shirt that just had a didn't have a collar, just was a, a black shirt and it just had a button. You know what you've seen a and and she said, Oh, Go ahead, Father. I said, thank you. Well, I did. That's a, I, I certainly did. Thank you. <clears throat> so, it's called a father. I don't know what to say back because I don't know what they say back. So I just said thank you. Just thank you. Oh, well, good. Well, I didn't know if I said bless you, child, or what. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know if I was just giving the cross or what. I, mean, I really didn't know if there was a code signal that said, give me my money back. You, you ain't the real deal. And so I don't know. But I was thankful that day I looked like somebody worthy to be given $2, huh? <clears throat> Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Boy, that's a victory lane. If you know anything about the heavens, you know that when he just said that, that's victory lane. He walked through victory lane. Who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Unless he tells you what to say. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. What is that? We do not have a high priest. Don't you love bragging? I love that. Listen to that brag. Huh? Let me brag. Let me brag a little bit about my high priest. Don't you love that? Let's be bold in our confession. Let me tell you about my high priest. I love that. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. We have one who has been tempted in all things as we yet without sin. Do you love that brag? I love that. That's your confession. This is my confession. How about your high priest? Ah, yeah, I know. Not mine. I mean, you could lay him up any high priest, right? What about your high priest? Eh, he's not that good. How about yours? He ain't that good. Yeah, I know. My high priest. So there's our confession. And look at our confidence in number six. Out of, confidence, out of confession, 
That kind of confession brings great confidence. Look at this confidence in verse 16 out of Hebrews 4. Let us therefore, there's that old trailer hitch in it, therefore, let us therefore draw near with confidence. Why? Listen, because I can stand to do, I, could, I, I can boast. I got a confession that needs, that's worth me heard. And out of that, therefore, draw near with confidence. Take that confession to confidence. Draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Now watch this. And receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now I'm going to tell you something. I wrote this down because I want you to be sure that you get this idea. I wrote the two Greek words down, time of need. It means to be able to come to one's aid in a timely, a, a timely, a timely, at the right time. Therefore, this means timely help. I mean, at the right time. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody say, boy, I, I, that couldn't have come at a better time, or I can't tell you how important that was, right? I mean, how many times have we had this happen to us, right? Timely need. Now, listen to what, because that's what he says. He says, therefore, I draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Notice the throne of grace, but look, you get more than grace. You know, you're going to get grace, and you're going to get grace in timely need, but you're also going to get mercy. You will receive mercy and find grace in timely need. You know what? And listen, here's the word you're missing. Confidence. That's a state of mind. Confidence. You know where my confidence is? It's in my confession that comes from the word of God. Right? Right? My high priest, man. It's my high priest. There is none like him. He told his disciples, you know, if you'd ask anything of my name, based on what I've been teaching you, I'd give it to you. Nobody ever asked. And then something. And when they did, it was like, <laughs> help me. <laughs> Peter drowning. That's what, and listen, isn't he wonderful? Listen, is he still there in timely need? Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, how good is that? You go like, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, let him go to the bottom. But he didn't. Cried for need, he took them. Right? You know why? Because he knew he had, he had weak faith. And his strong faith could make up for it. See, that's Romans 14 and 15. We don't pay attention to it, but that's Romans 14 and 15. You who are strong. You who are, have strong faith should help those who have weak. But sometimes the weak in faith have such bad attitudes, we just blow them off. I know, that's been my problem. That ain't the way to do it. Don't, don't do it that way. Peter closes his book of Second Peter. He closed his book in the most amazing way. So I'm going to close my lesson tonight the same way. I want to go with that. You can read all this other stuff. Um, third chapter, verses 17, 18. Watch, wait, close this great book. And boy, you know, don't you love to read? I mean, Peter's a character, ain't he? I mean, who, who does it? I mean, Peter is always first chosen on a sporting game or Hey, Peter, you want to go fishing? First guy, you bet. 
enthusiastic. He had his Achilles heel. But I'll tell you, when you read Peter as that one disciple of his and, you know, he goes gets a bad rap based on bad decisions like we all do. Boy, when you read his books, you see a real transformational guy. I mean, his books are worth reading. But I love the way he closed his book. You, therefore, now I hate to, stop, I hate to do that, therefore, but he's pounded this word, therefore, all over this place. So if, if I back up, then I got to go to 14. If I go to 14, then I have to go. So I just want to read his close. This is how he, this is how he signed off. We're not going to hear from Peter again. Peter believes his days are numbered. Just like Paul, this is his last will and testimony, just like 2 Timothy is Paul. He's, uh, I, won't, I won't see you again. Uh, this side, I'll see you on the other side. And this is what he says. This is his farewell to him. You therefore, beloved, which is a wonderful term, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, least being carried away by error of undisciplined men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I love this part because that's where we're going. That's where we're going. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And, and, yeah, and he's saying, that's an amen in that. He's saying, look, look, I love this. He, he says, boys, I'm leaving it with you. Then he says, Lord, I'm on my way. Don't you love that? Don't you love it? Don't you love it? The thing that he's going to remember is they turn him upside down and crucify him. Make him pay the price to preach Christ. You know what he's got in his head? This is what he's got in his head. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. I see you, Lord. I see you in a minute. May that be all of our prayer. May we have that kind of bold courage when it comes our day. What a great ending to a great book. Hmm?